History is full of amazing stories and memorable people. But we don't care about them. No hits, deep tracks only. Some of the most influential people in the world have been completely overlooked or just plain forgotten. We're digging deep into the history books to bring you their stories. I'm Phil. And I'm Matt. We're not historians. We're just two guys who enjoy a great story and plenty of laughs. This is History's B-Side. Today's B-Sider is the father of American music. So since this is our second music-related episode, I figured we'd kind of revisit one of the things we talked about at the beginning of the Max Martin episode. I know back then we talked about our musical tastes, but I don't know if we discussed our personal experiences as musicians ourselves. I do remember that during our bios, when we did each other's bios, I mentioned that you were a trombone virtuoso. (laughs) I think you were always a much better musician than I was. You were first chair. You got to give yourself some credit. I was not first chair. I was second chair to the best trombone player in the state of Ohio. So I always refer to myself as the second best (laughs) trombone player in the state of Ohio. I I, I see. But truly, I mean, how do you see your time as a musician? And like, what was your relationship with that part of yourself like? Uh, I mean, I'm kind of not joking when I say that you were a better musician than me because I mean, I I think you were a very talented musician, but when I say that I'm not like trying to say that you you were like this insane musical (laughs) expert either, but like you, you genuinely cared about your music and like you, you just put a lot of time (laughs) and effort into it. And I never really don't think I took it that seriously. I mean, I, I definitely cared and like wanted to be good, but I just like, I never really practiced as much as I should or studied hard into like what makes sense musically I kind of just learned to play the notes and then played it to what I thought sounded okay yeah do you remember when you chose trombone as your instrument or any of like the early lessons you took or the first song you learned uh well we did those things in elementary school where like the high school kids would come and let us try out their instruments and I think I Mm -hmm. always liked the trombone because i thought it looked cool that it had a slide versus any buttons and it's kind of unique in that sense but then i also remember thinking like the saxophone was super cool so at some point i wanted to play the saxophone and then there might have been a couple other instruments in there i don't even remember what i wrote because we had to write down like our top three choices when the high school kids came and i think i wrote trombone as number one which is probably why i ended up playing it but I don't know. I I guess I would have been open to playing other instruments as well. And I think I could. I just, like I said, never really put in the effort to really learn anything else. Yeah. I played piano when I was a real little kid, but I never liked to practice. So my (laughs) mom made me stop taking lessons, which was fair. (laughs) That's fair. I always hated practicing for lessons when I was much younger, unless I had like a specific goal that I wanted to hit, like the senior solo. I did as little as I could to prepare for those lessons. So the ensemble that we played in, which was like the top tier concert band of our high school, we were required to take private lessons for, right? And I can comfortably admit this now because I'm no longer in high school and (laughs) not obligated to take lessons for anything, but I did not take lessons in high school. I um, had a band director friend who signed off on my forms for me (laughs) (laughs) as if he was my private teacher. And he would like help me when we had audition pieces. I'd work with him like once or twice just to go over it. But I was not taking private lessons through high school like we were supposed to be. what a scandal. I know, right? This is juicy stuff, History of (laughs) B-Side listeners. Yeah, the secrets are finally coming out uh, 11 years post high school. I know. I think we have to retract your entire experience in Wind Ensemble. Yep. Uh, you're being, you're being I'll retroactively be demoted canceled. to <laughs> Symphonic Band or whatever was below that. So the reason, one of the reasons I asked about any of the early songs you listened to is because our B-sider for today, Stephen Foster, one of his most famous songs and the only one I knew before researching him was Camp Town Races. And the reason that I knew this song is because It was like the third or fourth song in the very first book 
I ever got for the saxophone. And I learned it and played it over and over and over again when I first... Like fifth grade? <laughs> yeah, like in fifth grade. <laughs> it was literally like three lines long. You just repeated it over and over and over again. But... Do you have your saxophone it's... with you? Can you play it now? I'm not going to do that. <laughs> that would make sing great it. podcast content. You can it sing it. That works content. too. I'm going to sing it later because I think we talk about it and you ask about the doodahs, so... Okay. <laughs> So before we get into Stephen Foster's life and his work as a composer, given that we're labeling him the father of American music, I think it would do us well to define what that means, define what American music is um, to us, or maybe what you think it, it means to society at large. Do you have any thoughts on that? I think to define American music is a tough task in, like, in and of itself. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of music genres that are a lot more American than maybe we even think about. Like, I think if you were talking about modern American music, we would almost default to country, which is kind of embarrassing, I think, because a lot of Americans would claim to hate country music. But it is like yeah. pretty much the most popular genre and kind of stems a lot from American roots. Because I was thinking about that, too. Like, there are... I mean, if you look at like Mexican culture, there's mariachi music, and we kind of think of that in a, almost like a cartoony way now because you have the mariachi bands that play at Mexican restaurants, and like mm -hmm. that is very important in their culture. But we don't have, I don't know, like what music would you hear at an American restaurant in another country? And it's also <laughs> funny because when you do travel to other countries, a lot of the like general ambiance pop music that plays is our same American pop music too. Right. So I don't know. I feel like music and entertainment itself kind of just has this American ideal to it overall. But obviously those are more newer modern genres that wouldn't be kind of the basis of American music. So I think back to like jazz has a lot of American roots that, and jazz has roots to all kinds of other music that we hear today. Like most modern R and B hip hop and even country and other genres do stem from jazz um, yeah. so I, that might be more like a cultural thing in itself jazz because i mean that that comes from black culture and that's not necessarily where we pull american culture from for a variety of different reasons right well that's kind of where i was headed with this because the more I researched Stephen Foster and you listen to his music and look where it went, you kind of had these two almost competing origins for American pop music and American music in general. And that was folk music or what we would later consider country and then the blues, which was essentially folk music, but it came out of slavery. Mm -hmm. it, it stemmed from songs that, you know, spiritual hymnals or cultural songs that slaves would sing and that grew into jazz which grew into rock and roll and rhythm and blues and soul and a lot of the genres of music we have today were directly influenced by either the blues or country and i feel like stephen foster was more on that latter side but one of the things he did well that we'll talk about too is blend different types of music and different cultures in his compositions which like you mentioned it's kind of hard to do with america right we have so many different cultures it's a huge melting pot and it's hard to draw like a direct line back to a specific type of music that you know was the birth of it all yeah and i think i mean a lot of american culture is like that too though there's not like one american culture and I don't know. There's mm -hmm. probably other countries that feel that way, or there's probably other countries that look at America and think, yeah, you're all the same. <laughs> but I feel like most Americans don't claim the United States as their ancestry, like as their <laughs> native yeah. land. So if you, if there's like a defining, maybe not music, but food or some kind of tradition to you, you're going to assign that to your own ancestral roots, not to America. So it is hard to pinpoint right. like what is organically American. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I mean, I think it all has ties to the original countries immigrants came from. But I think in terms of like jazz, right, it didn't come from any other country. Right. Yeah. It was born here. 
the blues, like I said, was born here. I don't know that like folk mu- folk music definitely wasn't born here, but country music as a style of folk music was certainly born here out of, you know, several different cultures. There were Scottish and Irish hymns and folk ballads that influenced country. It was partially influenced by blues itself. So I think, like I said, country and blues and then those that came after them are things we I would solidly consider American genres of music that now the world over has co-opted into their own pop culture. What is bluegrass? Is that like an older version of country or is it a lot more modern than I'm thinking it to be? So bluegrass music is a subgenre of American folk and roots music that developed in the 1940s, specifically in the United States Appalachian region. <laughs> so, so it's, it's country from I mean, it's part of like Americana. It's born in America, I guess. Yeah. The one thing that would different it says the one thing that differentiates it from country music is that the instrumentation is usually purely string bands, meaning like guitar, banjo, mandolin, yeah. fiddle, and bass. None of them newfangled techno drums. Tech- <laughs> no eight oh eights in your bluegrass music. <laughs> Auto tune bluegrass. Is, that is a crossover I now want. I want like <laughs> bluegrass hip-hop i'm sure that's a thing it probably is i I feel like it has to be a thing so all this to say there's this main question that i kind of wanted us to consider and revisit later as we learn about stephen foster and that question is should we consider stephen foster the father of american music or is there elsewhere to maybe look for a b-sider later on down the road (laughs) well you did the research I did do the research. Let's dive in. <laughs> so like many of our B-siders, there's not a lot of information about Foster out there. Though there are many biographies of him due to his importance in American music culture, details differ widely. Among other issues, Foster wrote very little biographical information about himself and his brother Morrison Foster destroyed much information that he judged to reflect negatively upon the family. Why would he destroy it? Like, was it revisionist history trying to make the family look better, or did he have some kind of jealousy of his brother's success that he was trying to maybe tear him down a bit? Yeah, I def- I didn't find anything that suggested jealousy as a motivator, but I think it had more to do with the ways... Foster was judged later on in life and past his life for the darker side of his compositions, which we'll get into talking about. He wrote for minstrel shows, which if you don't already know what they are, we'll discuss it. But they had a very racial connotation and are now Mm. considered highly offensive. He also was an alcoholic and was known for poor drinking habits and poor behavior while he was drinking. So there's just things that don't reflect on Stephen Foster well that I think his brother Morrison was trying to, you know, shove under the rug to protect the reputation of the family and of Stephen. He's just a dark and mysterious musician. Yeah. He's a struggling artist. Exactly. Can't you let him be an archetype? (laughs) Exactly what we said about, what, Dietrich Eckhart and maybe some (laughs) other people on our show. So the family lived in a northern city. Pittsburgh, but they didn't support the abolition of slavery. And this is, I guess, the first clue in a long line of contradictory evidence as to whether or not Stephen Foster was a racist himself, was supportive of slavery. It's not entirely clear his actual view of the status of black people in the United States, but that wasn't that unusual at the time. So when you say they didn't support the abolition of slavery... Does that mean that they mm-hmm. were pro-slavery or were they more like pro, for lack of a better word, pro-choice that like people could decide or states should be able to decide whether or not they had slavery? I don't know their exact stance. I imagine they were probably pro-choice. Um, it, there's nothing to indicate they were pro-slavery. They didn't own slaves themselves, but they certainly weren't abolitionists. So I think maybe a pro-choice somewhere in the middle viewpoint was likely what they held themselves Mm -hmm. but this doesn't necessarily indicate that that's what Stephen held 
you know, he would have been a g- different generation than his parents. So he might have had more progressive views. Right. So Foster was born in Lawrenceville, Pennsylvania, on July 4th, 1826. It's a true American born on July 4th. <laughs> what more do you need? That's why he's the father of American music. Yeah. He was born to William Barclay Foster and Eliza Clayland Tomlinson Foster, with three older sisters and six older brothers. Wow. His parents were of Scottish and English descent. He attended private academies in Allegheny, Athens, and Tawanda, Pennsylvania, and received an education in English grammar, diction, the classics, <laughs> which I feel like are, is probably just classic writing, right? penmanship, Latin, Greek, and mathematics. So seems like a fairly well-rounded right. education as a young boy. In fact, we just mentioned the song Camp Town Races during our intro, and the site of the actual Camp Town Races is a mere 30 miles from Athens, Pennsylvania, and only 15 miles from Tawanda. And I know you mentioned about Camp Town Races is that Duda song, because that's the one that yes. jumped out to me, because I, I know a lot of his songs I've probably heard, but wouldn't recognize, but that's the one I immediately recognized just from the name of it. Yeah. It's like, Camp Town Races, sing this song. I think those are the lyrics. Sing yeah, this song. Yeah, I don't song. know the lyrics. Duda, <laughs> I just Duda. know the, the uh, tune of it. He did not have formal instruction in composition, but he was helped by a man named Henry Kleber, a German-born music dealer in Pittsburgh. What is a music dealer? You know, like, instead of dealing drugs on the street corner, <laughs> he's got mixtapes in the back of his car. <laughs> That's where my mind went. <laughs> No, so at this time, a music dealer would have, basically a music store owner, he would have sold musical instruments. As we'll talk about later with music of this day, there was no recorded music. So the only way to distribute it was through sheet music. So music dealers would have also sold a selection of sheet music as well. So it would have been kind of like a one-stop shop for instruments and music itself. Foster's education did include a brief period at Jefferson College in Cannonsburg, Pennsylvania, which is now part of Washington and Jefferson College. He soon left Cannonsburg to visit Pittsburgh with another student and didn't return. So he's a young man in college. He's got this slight musical background and a little bit of mentorship from this Henry Kleber guy. Um, Takes off to Pittsburgh, the big city, and never comes back. So... (laughs) This is kind of where his music career takes off. Um, But before we get into that, we're going to take a short break and we will be right back. Matt, you like coffee, right? I love coffee. Would you ever want to buy me a coffee? Anytime, Phil. Just say the word. You know, our dedicated listeners could also buy me a coffee. Could they buy me a coffee as well? They could buy you a coffee. This sounds fantastic. We set up this service called Buy Me a Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side. And people can buy us a coffee? Yeah. It's really just a way for people to support the show if they enjoy the show. And if they're listening to the show, we sure hope you enjoy it. Yeah, otherwise you're just, I mean, wasting your time. (laughs) At buymeacoffee.com slash histories b-side, there's three ways that our listeners can interact with the show. Number one, you can just donate to the show by clicking buy them a coffee. Two, you can join as a member for $10 a month or $100 a year. Being a member gains you some pretty cool perks. You get access to our monthly bonus episode, History's B-Side Battles, access to our future episode queue, a name shout out on a future episode. We'll also send you a handwritten thank you postcard and sticker set and more perks will be announced as we continue on. There's also some different extras that people can get on our buy me a coffee website. Things like choosing the topic for a future episode. If there's a person, lesser known person in history that you have an interest in, let us know and we'll do an episode all about them. You can also buy sets of custom postcards, sticker sets, and future merchandise that we add on there as well. Or you can draft your own advertisement script and we will promote whatever you want in a segment like this. The website again is buymeacoffee.com 
slash histories b-side matt yeah you owe me a coffee oh do i get a coffee too you're buying all right All right, welcome back. So when we left off, we had kind of talked about Foster's early life. He had a slight kind of self-paced, self-taught music education with a little bit of guidance and composition from a music dealer. Stephen Foster grew up in a part of Pittsburgh where many European immigrants had settled and was accustomed to hearing the music of the Italian, Scots, Irish, and German residents. He composed his first song when he was 14 and entitled it the Tioga Waltz. I looked up what Tioga is, and the only thing I could find is that it's the name of a county in New York. I but, can see that being I mean, yeah. the entire reason that he named it that. I don't know if there's any connection there, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And the very first song he published was titled Open Thy Lattice Love. It sounds raunchy, Sexy. doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does sound pretty raunchy, though when you read back the lyrics, this is at a time where things didn't get any more suggestive than the title might might seem. The The song ma- mainly is about him or the narrator, I suppose, falling in love with a beautiful woman. But the, the raunchiest line in it is, open thy lattice. Well, that wouldn't... I feel like when you hear that from a modern lens, that sounds like, I don't know, some kind of garment, but it's probably more like yeah. a window. Probably. You're probably right, actually. (laughs) Soon after moving to Pittsburgh, he signed a contract with the Christie Minstrels, one of the most important early minstrel companies. It was during this period that he wrote most of his best-known songs. Camp Town Races, Nellie Bly, who, you know, we've got our own B-Sider episode about her. She got her pen name from? She she got her her pen name from this song. That's the one we named or mentioned Stephen Foster on because that's where her pen name came from yeah other well-known songs of his include ring to banjo old folks at home my old kentucky home which are kind of the same song they're just different adaptations lyrically of the same tune old dog trey and genie with the light brown hair which was written for his wife jane denny mcdowell jane and Stephen were only married a short time from 1850 through 1853 when she reportedly left him due to his alcoholism. The two had one child together, a daughter, nine months after their wedding. Little honeymoon baby. <laughs> Wonder why they got married when they got married. <laughs> that doesn't I doubt they that. knew that. Yeah. I, doubt, I doubt they knew that soon, though. I'm sure they were doing all kinds of pregnancy tests. Pregnancy and tests. <laughs> <laughs> early ultrasounds in the 1850s. Yeah. Many of Stephen Foster's songs had Southern themes, yet Foster never lived in the South and visited only once during his 1852 honeymoon. When the baby was conceived. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any reason why his song said Southern themes? I think it has to do mostly with the fact that he seemed to be a very... His influences seem to be very widespread. He wrote about a lot of different topics in American pop culture at the time, and this would have been just before the Civil War. So the whole narrative around Southern culture versus Northern culture would have definitely been a thing. He was also located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which, while it was a Northern city, was pretty much right up against the beginning of the Southern states. (laughs) So it's not surprising that some of these songs had Southern themes. Because he really did write about the full kaleidoscope of American experience during did his career. Did he feel a particular connection to the South, though, that he would be writing as if he was from there? I don't know. I mean, he has two songs in particular, My Old Kentucky Home, which I just mentioned, and Swanee River, which is in Florida. But it was noted that he wrote both of those songs without having ever visited those two places. <laughs> I think he was particularly good at tapping into the pulse of what people might want to listen to. And at the time, you know, we talked about Max Martin a lot, knowing 
how to write a good pop hit. And I think this is kind of that same thing. Stephen Foster knew how to write a good pop hit at the time that a lot of people would want to listen to. And part of that would have been writing about the South. Knew how to go viral in the 1850s. (laughs) Yep. It's just selling out, (laughs) selling out to the people who buy sheet music. (laughs) And what's more American than selling out? Racism. I'm glad you brought it up. (laughs) So now I want to get into that part of his career, because I think it's worth talking about before we discuss his contributions to the music industry and music culture in America before we decide how we view him as a B-sider and as the father of American music. So I mentioned a short bit ago that his first contract was with the Christie Minstrels, which was not only one of the most important early minstrel companies, but the one that kind of set the stage and traditions that would follow in minstrel theater. And if you're not familiar with this type of entertainment, I guess you could call it. (laughs) Minstrel shows, also called minstrelsy, were an American theatrical form popular from the early 19th to the early 20th century. And they were founded on the comic enactment of racial stereotypes. I like that this is an American theatrical form. Comic enactment of racial stereotypes. Nailed it. Like when people say that racism isn't like built into systemic american ideology like it's literally as american as baseball and apple pie and yeah everything we love about this country (laughs) i mean it is in a way baked into the fabric of a lot of our culture especially from this time period yeah the tradition itself reached its zenith between 1850 and 1870 which kind of makes sense with the you know end of the Civil War and Reconstruction would have probably started a decline in this type of entertainment. Mm -hmm. Although the form gradually disappeared from the professional theaters and became purely a vehicle for amateurs, its influence endured in vaudeville, radio, and television, as well as in the motion picture and world music industries of the 20th and 21st centuries. As a minstrel writer, many of Foster's musical lyrics often contained hateful racial ideas, Some of Foster's songs were written in black dialect and intended to be performed in blackface by a white actor or singer. And this is how many of the minstrel shows were. You know, it was a white performer in blackface and the the performances usually characterized black people as either dumb or goofy or kind of stumbling, bumbling. I mean, I don't think that's surprising to any of us that are used to the way people talked about slaves and black people back then Um, but it is kind of shocking to look back on now as you know it was like something people went and looked at on friday night like after dinner are you sure they weren't just chimney sweeps covered in soot like black peter from our anti-santas episode i feel like black peter was controversial for the same reason (laughs) yeah of course he was (laughs) he wasn't really a chimney sweep that's the modern way that people can still get away with it (laughs) No, no, no. He's a. Chi- they they were all chimney sweeps. <laughs> Weird how many chimney sweeps were featured in <laughs> minstrel shows and other it's almost American like entertainment. A third of the country was chimney sweeps. <laughs> <laughs> Very present in our culture. Were chimneys even that much of a thing then? Like, <laughs> I don't know. At this time in England, definitely. Today's B-sider is that. the inventor of the chimney. <laughs> Coming soon on History's (laughs) B-Side. So, of course, being a minstrel writer at the beginning of his career, he ends up writing a lot of songs that don't have the best viewpoint or color to them. Pun definitely not intended. Oh, gosh. (laughs) Ken Emerson, a music historian and Foster biographer, says, These songs are a source of racial embarrassment and infuriation. Although some of Foster's blackface lyrics are abhorrent, at their best, they imbued African Americans with a dignity and pathos that were unprecedented at the time. This is kind of hard for me to mentally grasp because of what we just talked about. And I feel like the phrase, at their best, they imbued African Americans with dignity hurts my soul to say. (sighs) But when you consider the other standards at the time, it's true that you know, he did approach 
the topic of describing African Americans in his songs with a progressive attitude for that day. Quote, unquote, you know, progressive. <laughs> like, right. this is going to be exactly what we say when we say it was the times on our podcast and it was the times and he was sort of progressive, even though he was still saying <laughs> some pretty bad things. Kind of goes to show how how bad it was. <laughs> Look how far was, we've like, come. <laughs> so some of the ways that he had this unprecedented regard for African-Americans are present in his songs. We talked about the song Nellie Bly or Nellie was a lady. And this was actually the first time a songwriter had ever called a black woman lady in a song before. That alone was groundbreaking, which is still bonk, like crazy to me. Unbeknown to most of the throng that sing its lyrics on Derby Day, my old Kentucky home does not celebrate cavaliers and crinolines in the Old South. It invokes Uncle Tom's cabin and indicts slavery for breaking up black families. Smithsonian Magazine described the song as, quote, a condemnation of Kentuckys and slavers who sold husbands away from their wives and mothers away from their children, and as the lament of an enslaved person who has been forcibly separated from his family and his painful longing to return to the cabin with his wife and children. So it's interesting. I tried really hard to look up the original lyrics for the song, but it's been revised so many times that most of the lyrics are kind of whitewashed and boy, I wonder why <laughs> made better. But from its start, this song had kind of a questionable reputation where many people thought it was racist. Other people argued that it was arguing against slavery. And I don't know if anybody ever really knows. I do think it's an interesting part of his songwriting that he leaves things a little bit ambiguous for the listener. So do you think he was intending to leave things ambiguous or is it that we have just such a hard time of putting ourselves in the mindset of the time that we can't really judge from a modern viewpoint whether he was progressive or not? I think a little bit of both. I, th I think it's a couple things. I think it's that. It's just hard for me to see the cultural context in which these songs were being written, because A, mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about what else was out at the time and about pop culture at the time. I don't know what the common opinions across the whole country were of the day. But I also think, I mean, when you read his lyrics, which we will in a short bit, they are still kind of, compared to today's standards in pop culture and pop music, pretty poetic and up for interpretation. They're very lyrical i feel like pop music today is pretty pretty straightforward you know kind of blunt and you know many songs at least don't have a ton of metaphorical nuance to them whereas stephen foster's lyrics though you can kind of pull out the message does take a bit more critical thought and you kind of have to dig into the lyrics to understand what he's trying to say does that make sense yeah, I think, well, I think the idea of like trying to put ourselves in the mindset of the time period is very difficult. I think it's easy and we probably use it as a crutch to say, oh, it was the times. And, you know, if he's abdicating against slavery, then he's clearly more progressive. But All right. <laughs> it's hard to like know what that line was in 1850s, 60s, whatever time period we're in. Because I don't know, like that was a time when... I mean, you would literally look at a black person and not think of them as human. And right. for most people living in the 21st century, you can't even fathom that because it's pretty understandable that like humans are humans and not property. Right. Yeah, I think it is hard to put yourself in the shoes of his listener at the time. I think it is important to mention that in the 1850s, he did associate with a Pittsburgh area abolitionist leader named Charles Shiraz and wrote an abolitionist play himself. So his music and artwork wasn't just reserved for the racist minstrel shows. I don't think this is a necessary I don't think this is necessarily a defense of that part of his art form, but I think we should take the whole spectrum of his work in that he was reflecting what was going on in America at the time from a broad range of viewpoints, right or wrong. But I thought that was an important point to make as we consider whether or not it's appropriate to 
call him the father of American music. So having written an abolitionist play, does that mean, unlike his family, he was anti-slavery? I don't, I don't know. I, it's hard to tell. Um, it, and this isn't even like, we'll talk about in a second, this isn't the only time Foster's material seems contradictory of itself. He wrote songs about lots of different subjects that, you know, one song would be from this viewpoint and another from the opposite. So I don't know that just because he wrote an abolitionist play that he was necessarily anti-slavery. I do think, I mean, it's at least a statement that he was in the moderate camp. I don't think he was pro-slavery. I don't know that somebody at this time when it was this heated could have been pro-slavery and also writing abolitionist plays. Right. Whereas I see it as perfectly possible that one might write an abolitionist play and believe slavery is wrong while still caricaturizing black people. Yeah, absolutely. Because that would have been a much more, you know, as unfortunate as it is, that would have been a much more reasonable stance of the day than the opposite would be. Right. And one of the other subjects on which Foster's material seems ambiguous is alcoholism or temperance. An alcoholic himself, Foster wrote songs in support of drinking, such as My Wife is a Most Knowing Woman, Mr. and Mrs. Brown, and When the Bowl Goes Round, while also composing temperance songs, such as Comrades Fill No Glass for Me or The Wife. So... Do you have like lyrical examples from these? Because I think it's funny that he has a song for drinking and against drinking that both reference his wife. Yeah, I mean, so my wife is a most knowing woman is pretty much about what you probably think it's about. And it references a man coming home after a night of drinking to his wife who catches him coming in drunk. The opening lines of the song go, my wife is a most knowing woman. She is always finding me out. She never will hear explanations, but instantly puts me to rout. <laughs> There's no use to try and deceive her if out with my friends night or day. In the most inconceivable manner, she tells where I've been right away. She says that I'm mean and inhuman. <laughs> oh, my wife is a most knowing woman. So How dare she? <laughs> the first verse of that one, the... Mary Brown and Mr. Brown, Mr. and Mrs. Brown one is basically a back and forth call and response between Mrs. and Mr. Brown, where the same thing's happening. Mrs. Brown's angry with Mr. Brown for coming home drunk. He's trying to like beg her to hear him out and not be mad. And they go back and forth. I don't remember if you said this. How was uh, Foster's relationship with his wife? Wasn't great. It wasn't. I mean... <laughs> They were only married, they were married in 1850, she left him in 1853 because of his alcoholism, so I don't think they had a good time. It's a little on the nose, don't you think? Pretty much. And then, of course, his temperance song, Comrades Fill No Glass For Me, is essentially a ballad where at the end of each verse, while talking about the you know positives and negatives, mostly negatives, of drinking... He exclaims, comrades, fill no glass for me. So, like I said, he was capable of writing from two different viewpoints. At least when it came to pop culture opinions of the day. So, all of this to say that his portfolio of over 200 songs ended up covering a broad range of topics from almost every imaginable viewpoint. And many of those leave interpretation up to the listener. So you think he was being intentionally ambiguous with how he felt about these sort of controversial topics? I think so. I mean, at the very least, I think he was trying to give a voice to both sides of certain topics and certain viewpoints. Because there doesn't seem to be, at least politically, there doesn't seem to be a leaning one way or the other on most of these things. Right. You know, he had more progressive songs. He had more conservative songs. He had church hymnals. He had drinking songs. He had pop culture songs that were kind of just about nothing. <laughs> he had really intense songs that were about death and dying. Um, I think it just goes to show the range of his songwriting ability. 
maybe he was just trying to you know resonate with whoever happened to find his music and throwing stuff at the wall to see what sticks yeah maybe i mean that's how i write songs <laughs> To revisit Ken Emerson, the Foster biographer, he explains the importance to the history of popular song, and also why his songs continue to resonate more than 150 years after he wrote them. He says, I think that Stephen Foster really did create popular music as we still recognize it today, and he did it because he took together all these strands of the American experience. He clearly effectively merged other ethnic genres into single music, And I think he merged them in a way that appeals to the multicultural mixed experience of America in its history and culture. Emerson also points out that many of Foster's songs were more sophisticated than he had originally imagined. He says, there's one song he wrote, for instance, the Glendy Burke, which deliberately quotes two measures of Schubert and then quotes two measures of a Robert Burns Scottish ballad so that you have a sort of Scottish sound and a German sound spliced. And that kind of wit and craft is something that people didn't realize Foster possessed when we used to think of him as sort of this native folk poet with his finger on the pulse of the American soul, in a sort of of salt-of-the-earth kind of way. He was a much more conscious writer who didn't just compose his songs, he contrived them. So I think his songwriting was very intentional, back to what you were saying, was this conscious, um, and that he was trying to meld all of these different genres of music from immigrants and different walks of life into one sound well that's what i was thinking too is you talk about what is born in america as far as music culture but even his music stems from scottish roots german roots like granted those are both very european countries but it kind of shows that you know where the roots of america came from what is american isn't really truly born in america (laughs) right yeah yeah and it's foster's ability to write universally catchy tunes overlaid with lyrics that reflected the american experience in its full spectrum that made him the most famous songwriter of the 19th century and even abroad he's known as one of the most recognized american composers of all time biographers note that the popularity of his music is exceptional given the technology of the day Without recording and playback technology, such as vinyl and radio, Foster's music was mainly distributed in the form of sheet music, meant to be played by or for the buyer. So I was actually wondering about this, because there wouldn't have been a way for him to record music, right? His music was only basically written down to be performed by others? Pretty much, yeah. You would have needed either to have musical skills yourself or know someone who could play music and sing to have these songs played for you you would pretty much get a piece of sheet music the same way we did in marching band when you bought a song so would he have needed like an orchestra to perform them or were they written so that someone i don't know with a piano or whatever could sit down and play his music most of them were written primarily on piano okay that would have been his main songwriting tool foster's last four years were spent in new york city There's little information on this period of his life, although family correspondence has been preserved. It's known that Foster became sick with a fever in January of 1864. Weakened, he fell in his hotel in the Bowery, cutting his neck. His writing partner, George Cooper, found him still alive but lying in a pool of blood. Foster died in Bellevue Hospital three days later, at the age of 37. Jeez. It's another young death. I mean, wasn't your last topic... Ada Lovelace died at 36. Yeah. It is kind of crazy the impact he had, though, because his career wouldn't have been particularly long. No, I mean, when we consider that he moved to Pittsburgh during college, he would have only been working as a composer for 20 years. Yeah. Or less, I suppose. Some biographers describe different accounts of his death. Historian Joanne O'Connell speculates in her biography, The Life and Songs of Stephen Foster, that Stephen may have killed himself, a common occurrence during the Civil War. George Cooper, who was with Foster until he died, said, quote, He lay there on the floor, naked, suffering horribly. He had wonderful big brown eyes, and they looked up at me with an appeal I can never forget. He whispered, I'm done for. Unlike Foster's brother Morrison, who was not in New York and said Foster was ill and cut his neck on a wasp basin, 
Cooper mentioned no broken crockery and also said Foster had a large knife for cutting up apples and turnips. Morrison may have covered up Foster's suicide. As we mentioned earlier, Morrison was fond of, you know, covering up embarrassing family, family secrets. History, yeah. yeah. Evelyn Mornwick, Morrison's daughter, also said the family would have covered up the suicide of their uncle if they could have. Why do you think he would have committed suicide? I mean, I think there's a couple of reasons for this. Like I said above, it's a it was a common occurrence during the Civil War. I think the same way you see now with the pandemic where mental health is worse across the board and you see higher rates of suicide as a result, the Civil War tore our country apart for several years and did the same with the economy. And it would have been a very hard time for everyone, even those who weren't directly involved in the Civil War. So that could have been part of it. It's also likely that his alcoholism didn't help. Yeah, I mean, that's true. We know that alcoholism doesn't help suicidal ideation or suicidal thoughts. So it's very likely that these things and maybe personal stresses, like the stress of losing his wife, might have, you know, come to roost. Mm -hmm. As O'Connell and musicologist Ken Emerson have noted, several of the songs Foster wrote during the last years of his life foreshadow his death such as The Little Ballad Girl and Kiss Me, Dear Mother, Ere I Die. Is there stuff in the lyrics that you found that would kind of hint at that? Sort of. It, it, Like I said, it's a little bit more metaphorical, and it's not very direct, but the refrain of the song is, "'Tis my father's song, and he can't live long. Everyone knows that he wrote it. For I've been down at the hotel door, and all the gentlemen bought it." So... He only references that in one line there. And then later on, he says, Ho, little girl, what makes you cry? Um, kind of referencing this girl whose father doesn't have long to live. And then the other one, Kiss Me, Dear Mother, Ere I Die, is a little bit more direct. And it says, Bend over my pillow, my mother dear. Life's chilling clothes is now drawing near. Drive from about me these clouds of fear. Breathe o'er my brow a parting sigh. So he starts writing music that has a little bit more focus on the themes of death and dying. But it's odd because he's not like, it's not like he's old, old at this point. People didn't right. live as long as they do now back then. But 37 would have been a young age to start obsessing about death and dying in his art. And that so could I think that some might depression. be. Right. I mean, I think it wouldn't have surprised me that he had... In fact, I'd be surprised if he didn't suffer from some form of depression. Hmm. It's, it, I mean, it goes almost hand in hand comorbidity wise with alcoholism. And it's also common among artists. Why? I don't know. But it wouldn't have surprised me if he was suffering from some form of mental illness. Right. In the end, Ken Emerson says in his 2010 Stephen Foster & Co. that Foster's injuries may have been either accidental or self-inflicted, leaving, again, the question open to interpretation. <laughs> when Foster died, his leather wallet contained a scrap of paper that simply said, Dear Friends and Gentle Hearts, along with 37 cents, one for each year of his life, in Civil War script and three pennies. The note is said to have inspired Bob Hillard's lyric for Dear Hearts and Gentle People, which was written in 1949. Foster was buried in the Allegheny Cemetery in Pittsburgh. Just to bring back that call back to Nellie Bly, she was sort of from Pittsburgh, not like from Pittsburgh directly, but she was working in Pittsburgh when she got her pen name Nellie Bly. So I wonder mm. if that's really the local connection that they were both kind of from the same area. And that was one of his yeah. songs. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure it's possible. I It might be why his, it might be why Nellie Bly's boss knew of the song. Right. And had it on hand to nickname her. Right. After Stephen's death, Morrison Foster became his literary executor. As such, he answered requests for copies of manuscripts, autographs, and biographical information. One of the best loved of his works was Beautiful Dreamer which was published posthumously in 1864. 
Foster is honored on the University of Pittsburgh campus with the Stephen Foster Memorial, a landmark building that houses the Stephen Foster Memorial Museum, the Center for American Music, as well as two theaters, the Charity Randall Theater and Henry Heyman Theater, which are both performance spaces for Pitt's Department of Theater Arts. It is the largest repository for original Stephen Foster compositions, recordings, and other memorabilia his songs have inspired worldwide. Two state parks are named in Foster's honor, the Stephen Foster Folk Culture Center State Park in White Springs, Florida, and Stephen C. Foster State Park in Georgia. Both parks are on the Suwannee River, which we mentioned earlier yeah. he had that song about. There is also Stephen Foster Lake at Mount Pisgah State Park in Pennsylvania that is named in his honor. Mount Pisgah State Park is in Pennsylvania? There's lots of different Mount Pisgahs oh, okay. as I've come to. Like, there's one in Oregon. I've hiked there's a one Mount in Pisgah in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah, there's several different Mount Pisgahs. That's so weird. Must be a popular name for a mountain. I wonder why that is. <laughs> we'll have to look that up. Maybe that's a future episode. If you'd like to see any of his original handwritten scores, some of them were bought and put into private collections at the Library of Congress. So you'll have to go to Washington, D.C. to check those out. Although, I feel like the University of Pittsburgh probably has a couple as well. I mean, we both grew up relatively close to Pittsburgh. Have you ever seen anything about him? Yeah, I was like wholly unfamiliar with this topic. I was too. I His name was vaguely familiar, but outside of playing Camp Town Races in fifth grade, I had never heard of him. <laughs> I feel like this is probably one of those topics where like, he really isn't a B-sider because he is probably very well known as if you study American yeah. culture, I guess. But I don't know, it, it was interesting to me how much he, how much the racial influence affected his backstory like i thought he would just kind of be like the basis for what we view american music and not right. have all these other like underlying aspects to his story that we need to talk about yeah it was definitely eye-opening and i think it's also eye-opening to consider that just talking about the history of american pop music necessitates talking about racial themes and some of the more uncomfortable parts of our history What are you talking about? Racism is built into the American identity. (laughs) One of those uh, critical race theory pushing Antifa activists, Phil. (laughs) So you were questioning whether or not Stephen Foster should be the father of American music. Do you believe that or what do you think? I don't. I don't think any one person should be named the father of American music. um, Because I think everybody played an important part in developing what it became that might be kind of a non-answer but if i had to choose between blues and country or blues and you know stephen foster's style of folk music i would probably lean a little bit more heavily into the blues as far as what today matters more in terms of how it influenced what music sounds like today you don't think some of his music would have kind of led to blues in a way i don't i mean i think blues predated oh did it stephen foster at least the early roots of blues would have predated stephen foster it's possible he he used and was influenced by the blues but you know when you go back from like music that was popular in the 20th century like rock and roll which i i feel like kind of led to pop music in a way you know, rock and roll was influenced by rhythm and blues and jazz and jazz was influenced by blues rhythms. And all of those things, even country takes a bit from, from the blues. And so I feel like because they predate Stephen Foster, we can't just consider him the father of American music. I think he's a massively influential figure and I think could be considered the father of American pop music because of the way he wrote these simple, catchy tunes that could be sung and, and and sometimes played by anybody of relatively simple skill level. And I think the way he recorded, you know, American 
ideals and the American experience in such a broad way certainly influenced the culture of American songwriting. But I don't, I don't know that I want to call him the father of American music entirely. I like that you reference simple skill level like that of a fifth grader picking up the saxophone for the first time. Hey, they were simple. They were catchy. There's something to that. If you would have asked me to name one person that I thought could be called the father of American music, I definitely would have guessed John Philip Sousa, which probably did not influence (laughs) any American music. But like, what's more American music than the marches of John Philip Sousa? I mean, I think Sousa was an important figure. (laughs) I feel like there's going to be a John Philip Sousa question on my quiz. (laughs) I thought about it, but it didn't really tie into the episode. But all I right. guess if we're we're all wrapped up here, we can get into the quiz. All right. We'll be right back. All right. As our loyal listeners know, we like to end every episode with a short three-question quiz to test today's host, see how much he studied his topic and maybe things around his topic. And maybe you, the listener at home, is familiar with it and you can try to answer these questions as we go. How are you feeling about your quiz today? I feel moderate. I never feel good about the quizzes. I've had like one or two episodes where I was very confident going into the quiz. And I think I maybe got one of them right. (laughs) <laughs> usually i have no idea what to expect yeah i don't know what to expect on this one well all three questions are at least about stephen foster or his songs so they're i don't think they're terribly difficult the first one will be difficult and then the other two you might be able to guess one of them will be multiple choice all right i like multiple choice questions <laughs> all right question number one which is probably your hardest question and then it gets easier from there Foster was the first man to be paid a royalty on sheet music sales and the first American to make a career out of writing songs. But in 1857, he sold all rights to future songs to his publishers for how much money? Oh, God. If you'd like, you can guess like the modern amount of it, whatever the correlation is. I'm going to guess the money in his day pre-inflation okay i'm gonna say he sold it for a thousand dollars close-ish how much was it 500 1900 oh okay and today that would have about the same equivalency of sixty one thousand dollars just under sixty one thousand which is Hmm. a decent bit but like not really that much not for music royalties for an entire catalog. Right. So that's the thing is like if he had kept royalties on it, he they would be worth much, much more than what he sold his rights for. But today, a lot of his music or pretty much all of his music is in the public domain just because it's been so long that yeah. any kind of copyright on them has since expired. Question number two. This might be your easiest one. So I'm confident in you on this one. Oh, good. Foster is the only American composer credited with writing two official state songs. And I will say that you mentioned both of these song titles in the episode today. So, but your question is which two states? And if Kentucky for, for extra credit, if you can name the song, Kentucky would be my old Kentucky home. Mm -hmm. And I want to say Georgia. Georgia. But I don't know what song. Georgia is incorrect. Is it Florida? It is Florida. Swanee? It's not Swanee. But it is the most Dang. Florida sounding of his song names that you've mentioned. Oh, gosh. I'm like going back through the song titles. Old Folks at Home? Sure is. <laughs> <laughs> Is there a more Florida sounding there song title than Old Folks at Home? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> it's where it's all like the, the old retirement folks community go when they retire. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was so funny. <laughs> Bray Charles has an adaptation of Old Folks at Home. It's under a different title that I can't recall right now, but 
Yeah, isn't that the state song of Georgia? Georgia on my mind. Oh, I don't know, maybe. I don't know that that's really the state song of Georgia, but it should be. It is. It's Georgia on my mind. <laughs> Called it. Now I want to know what some of the other state songs are. Let's find out. <laughs> this feels like an after podcast research are topic. Are you read? Nope. This is going to be a mid podcast tangent, and I'm going to leave part of it in. Hang on, Sloopy. What do you think Ohio's is? The state rock song is Hang on, Sloopy. I don't know if there's another like state song. There is. It's kind of basic. It's beautiful, Ohio. <laughs> oh, lame. It's a ballad from 1969. Oregon State song is Oregon, my Oregon. <laughs> uh, South Dakota's is Hail South Dakota. So there's that. On point. All right. Moving on. Ready? <laughs> yes. All right. For your final question, Foster's most recorded song, which is Hard Times Come Again No More is frequently performed as a concert encore by what famous American recording artist? And this one is multiple choice. Hmm. Is it A, Dolly Parton, B, Bruce Springsteen, C, Billy Joel, or D, Stevie Nicks? Oh, that's hard. I feel like it's Bruce Springsteen. Correct. Yeah. You did good. I did all right. I'll take it. <laughs> also, Swanee River and Old Folks at Home are the same song. Are they really? Yeah. It's Old Folks at Home, parentheses, Swanee River. Oh, so you actually nailed revised that. revised lyrics. Yes. I didn't know Get that it. was the same song. I like that he didn't live in either of the states. <laughs> <laughs> Pennsylvania had no pride. They were just like, eh. Well, he... uh was not at home in Florida, and he wasn't quite an old folk. Pennsylvania State Song was written in 1990. What? <laughs> it's just called Pennsylvania. Some guy was just like, we don't have a state song. I'm going to write one and call it Pennsylvania. Well, as usual, we really appreciate you, our listener, for taking the time to learn about history with us. We hope you enjoyed this week's episode. If you have any questions or comments, or just want to reach out, please feel free at historiesbside at gmail.com, or you can find us on social media at historiesbside. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week. History's B-Side is an independent, listener-supported podcast. Leave us a review or subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting service, and follow along on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Histories B-Side. Send us your feedback or inquire about sponsorship and advertising opportunities by emailing us at historiesbside at gmail.com. You can donate to the show at buymeacoffee.com slash historiesbside. While you're there, check out our membership perks, merchandise, and more. This episode was researched and produced by your hosts, Matt Melito and Phil Hall. Thanks for listening to Histories B-Side.